morning. morning. I'm going to talk about some of the um, the energy and sustainability challenges that an airline faces, and um, hopefully that'll be thought provoking. It's 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 not all about buildings and ground vehicles for some companies. And um, at the end of my presentation, I've included some case studies, simple case studies that hopefully will illustrate some of the points I make before then. So Delta, as you probably know, is a large Atlanta-based airline with a lot of global partners, many of whom I've shown at the bottom of the slide. And um, I guess most important from an energy perspective, we operate 820 airplanes, what we call mainline airplanes. In addition, our six regional partners operate 450 more airplanes, and that's important because we buy all the fuel not only for the mainline planes, but for those 450 regional planes. So a lot of fuel, about 4 billion gallons of fuel we purchase in a year, um, and the associated emissions from that. So um, let's get into it. Fuel, um, as I've said, is a big component of Delta's, Delta's energy appetite. You might be surprised to learn that it's 99% of that appetite, pretty much regardless of how you measure it. If you measure it in terms of energy equivalency, if you measure it in terms of CO2 emissions, if you measure it in terms of our costs, um, fuel, jet fuel is it. You can see that pie, the pie chart there shows that everything else, electricity, fuel for our ground vehicles, uh, chemicals that translate to CO2 emissions are all in that little white slice on the pie chart. So fuel for us is the elephant in the room. And um, just as kind of an aside that will be important later, we use an internal um, rate of return or return on investment of about 2%, I mean two years rather. So a project has to pay for itself in two years typically for us to consider funding it. Otherwise the finance people um, kind of say, Go away. If you look at our operating costs for 2015, you can see that energy related costs, again, primarily fuel, comprise about 24% of um, running the airline. The biggest expense is salaries. Um, but in some years, like in 2014, when fuel comprised 36%, because jet fuel was a lot higher then, um, it was our largest single cost. So energy for Delta is, is a huge consideration um, in, in being competitive. And airlines, um, unlike some companies, some industries, are not inherently profitable. And so financial sustainability, consistent profitability, is really important to us. So um, it's heavily weighed in any decisions we make. Um, the airlines went through huge consolidation over the last eight years, trying to um, get more control over their product, trying to be less of a commodity. Um, that's what airlines worry about, I think, is commoditization being viewed as all the airlines are the same. So um, one of the ways we avoid, try to avoid being a commodity is by differentiating, our, differentiating ourselves through different um, initiatives, operational initiatives like trying not to cancel flights. Delta this year has gone over 150 days without canceling a single flight, which is like more than every other airline put together by far. Even, even considering that IT failure we had in August where we canceled flights for about a day and a half, we still were the leading major airline for fewest cancellations that month. So to give you an idea of how, how import, what importance we're placing on the issue of operational reliability. Uh, customer service is important, things like lie flat seats on international flights, Wi-Fi, even international Wi-Fi now, entertainment systems, um, increasing number of meals and things like that, sky clubs, all that stuff um, are important for an airline to try to distinguish itself, differentiate itself. But a lot of those things also come with a fuel penalty. Lie flat seats, way more, take up more space, less fuel efficient. International Wi-Fi creates more air resistance on the outside of the plane, um, more fuel. So a lot of times customer service initiatives are, in a sense, um, competing with our fuel saving initiatives. And um, we try to remind the company, my group, that um, that's a problem. 
a little bit about sustainability at Delta. Um, Delta was founded in uh, 1924, and at that time our founder, C.E. Woolman, wrote a book called Rules of the Road about how we would treat each other, how we would treat customers, how we would be a good uh, community citizen. And um, so in a sense, sustainability at Delta started when we got started as an airline, because obviously when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of people every day, customer service and dealing with your stakeholders, your employees, your customers, your communities, your, sh your um, shareholders is important for, um, for being sustainable. And you can see some of the other documents I've listed here. Um, the force of global good is Delta's philanthropic arm that tries to engage employees. Um, it gives away a lot of money to various causes like Habitat for Humanity and breast cancer research and hundreds of others. Um, you can see their goals of, a, of our, our sustainability goals, be a proactive, a positive force rather for, for um, local and global change, hopefully for the better. Um, improving external reporting. I think we're doing a better job every year of telling, us, or telling Delta's story. Uh, we have a climate change work plan. Obviously, we know as an airline we have an impact on the climate, and we're, we're working to reduce that. And much of this talk will touch on those issues. And engaging folks, whether it's our own employees or it's our customers or the communities we live in. Um, there's a annual survey called the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and Corporate customers fill out the survey every year. They're invited to fill it out. Many do. Um, Delta's the only U.S. airline that's ever been chosen for the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. This is our, we just found out last week that we've made it for the sixth year in a row now. So um, we're pleased with that because I think it, it shows that we, we're moving in the right direction for an airline. Um, we have oversight as a senior level from both our corporate leadership team, which is at the top eight or ten leaders at Delta, including the CEO, as well as a group that meets three or four times a year called the Corporate Environmental Leadership Council and our Executive Environmental Leadership Council, and they give us direction on the environmental um, issues that import, are important for Delta, which is a subset of all sustainability. So the airlines, um, as an industry, realize that we are kind of in the the headlights when you talk about climate change. As an industry, we're growing, especially not so much in the US. We kind of fly everywhere you'd want to fly already. But um, internationally, there's more growth. There's a lot of emerging markets, China, for example, where a lot of people who have never flown in their lives suddenly flying has become affordable. So there's predictions that by 2050, our, our percentage of emissions will grow from about 2% to 5% or more as other industries rein in their emissions and as airlines try to rein them in, but we don't have a lot of easy choices. There's not electric planes we can switch to. Even the best new planes are only maybe 15 or 20% better than the planes they're replacing. So the industry has com come up with its own goals. Um, the first one is the one we're living with right now, which is a 1.5% average annual improvement in fuel efficiency starting in 2009. So every year we try to get 1.5% better on average, and we'll talk about how we're doing on that. Um, we have a medium-term goal, which is called carbon neutral growth, and it says that um, after 2020, we will offset any emissions that exceed what we've um, been averaging right before 2020. So um, the airline, but they put a caveat on that that it only applies to international emissions. So it's, it's kind of um, kind of an iffy goal. The third goal is the most ambitious, the 50% reduction in emissions, all airline emissions, um, by 2050. And it relies a lot on the people at Georgia Tech and the people at other industries and universities to figure out how to make that happen. Delta doesn't design airplanes, we just fly them. So you know, we can only buy the products that are available. So we need new and better engines, better aircraft designs to make that goal. Um, the airline has defined up four what they call pillars to figure out how we're going to get, how we're going to reach these goals. The first one is technology, and uh, I'll talk about each of these a little bit more on the next slide. And then um, 
operations, infrastructure, and the last one is market-based measures. And um, let's talk about technology. Technology is by far the most promising way that airlines will reduce emissions over time. Uh, the Boeing 787, you know, significantly lighter, more fuel efficient than the air airlines that replaces the new Airbus A350, dramatically more fuel efficient airplane that will start flying in a year or two. Um, Delta currently has 300 new planes on order. I think that's our lar largest order book ever. Um, that'll replace, gosh, a third of our fleet. Was we there, right? One of the problems is you can't just go, go out to the local airplane lot and buy them, off, you know, buy them off the floor. You have to actually order them, and it takes two, three, five, ten years sometimes to get those planes. So there's this long curve between the time you order them and the time you actually receive them. Um, we also do upgrades to our existing fleet. We add winglets, those little curved things on the ends that Im improve um, their fuel efficiency. We take weight off planes. We put, as you probably know, uh, more higher seat densities on planes. We get seats with thinner backs and put them on so you have the same limited leg room, but at least no less. And um, that's good because it's like cramming more people in your car. Your car becomes more efficient the more people you can get in there. It's not, when you're the middle person in the back row, it's not, you know, it's hard to tell yourself, this is great because I'm being so fuel efficient. <laughs> but, you know, we like to say, well, it's global mass transit. So um, that's, that's how we, um, in the sustainability group at least, think about it. The marketing people would say, don't even talk about that. <laughs> um, maintenance, we do maintenance procedures that focus on um, making the plane more fuel efficient, making sure the flaps and slats are properly adjusted, uh, and engine washes, things like that, improve fuel efficiency of the plane as it's operating. And biofuels, biofuels is touted as a really promising um, way for airlines to be able to take our existing planes and fly them more efficiently, because instead of taking fuel that's been trapped in the ground for 100 million years, you're taking fuel that was a plant two weeks ago, so it's a short circuit for carbon, and uh, you're not freeing up new carbon at the ground. The problem right now is that biofuels are, well, there's two problems. One is that they're still pretty expensive compared to conventional fuel, especially since conventional fuel now is around two bucks a gallon. And biofuels can be you know, 10, 12, 15 bucks a gallon. So when you're using four billion gallons of fuel, of fuel in a year, that's, that's a big difference. Hard to justify spending that money. If we said, are you willing to pay more for your ticket? Some people might be, most people probably wouldn't be. They spend 30 minutes on the internet finding the cheapest ticket. They're not going to then say, oh, yeah, add on $50 for my additional fuel. Um, and then um, the other challenge is supply. In order to say you're making a meaningful investment in biofuels, we would have to buy, I don't know, 100 million, a billion gallons of biofuel. So where can you get that? The supply chain just doesn't exist right now for that. Um, also, you're competing with not just other fuel users, you compete with other industries. Biofuels typically are, are purer and better than petroleum-based fuels, so a lot of companies, like pharmaceutical companies, want them as their raw materials to make products, and they're willing to pay a lot more than a company like us that just wants to burn the stuff. If you're gonna, if you're gonna make a product where you can sell pills for 10 bucks a piece, then you know, $20 a gallon for biofuel doesn't seem like much to us. It's like, what, $20, are you kidding? It's, we can't even wrap our head around it. Um, the second approach, probably um, the easiest to implement, we're doing a lot of these things already, are operational efficiency, just flying your airplanes better, not running the auxiliary power unit when you're at the gate, but hooking it up to the, um, to the power unit, the air, air unit and electricity at the gate at the airport. So you're using um, local electricity, which is, has a lower carbon footprint and is less expensive. Um, different taxi procedures, almost all airlines now taxi with one engine instead of two. Um, different takeoff procedures, you don't necessarily have to do a full power takeoff in, in every city at every time of the day. You don't have to fly as fast as you possibly can, especially if it's a red-eye flight. Do people really care if they get there 10 minutes earlier? Probably not. You know, they probably just want to sleep another 10 minutes. Um, High-speed tractors to move the planes around instead of taxiing the planes whenever we can, especially for maintenance positioning of the planes. And um, all of these things are great. The problem is, of course, that 
generally they're just helping us offset new customer service initiatives. So most of these have incremental improvements. And then we go out and do something like, um, you know, lie flat seats. And that, off, that takes away the benefit from um, better flight planning, for example. So that, that's a continuing frustration for us is it's hard to move the overall fuel efficiency of your fleet in the right direction when you're also trying to provide better customer service, better operational performance, because those things typically use more fuel. The third pillar is one that has a lot of promise. It's infrastructure improvements, things like NextGen, which is the FAA version of better um, navigational systems. And um, the, the EU has one called Single European Sky. The EU is a mess. You can see in that map in the bottom left that currently each EU country controls its own airspace. So you're being transferred always from different airspaces. Um, single European sky will create a single Europe, kind of like the US, where it's controlled much more um, seamlessly and efficiently. The problem is um, the political systems around this, no, nobody wants to pay for this stuff. And so the airlines are reluctant to put this stuff on the airplanes if, if the FAA and other governments aren't putting it on the ground to talk to. And so you get this kind of a gridlock where, yeah, we know how to do it, but getting from knowing how to do it to actually doing it is really tough. Um, but ideas like these should save estimates are like 10, maybe 15% of fuel when they're fully implemented. Um, right now, airplanes are kind of um, ground-based. They talk to little receivers on the ground, and we kind of do a connect-the-dots way of flying. Um, when we eventually become satellite-based, we completely satellite-based, we will be able to fly much more direct routes, much more um, seamless takeoffs and landings. The fourth pillar um, is one that NGOs consider to be controversial, I guess. We consider it to be a kind of a stopgap or temporary measure. It's that red area on the bottom of the graph there. That represents um, the time between, say, now and 2035, 2040, when technology will really get there, when, you know, when suddenly technology makes airplanes dramatically more fuel efficient than they are now. But in the meantime, our emissions are going to grow because we're adding planes faster than, and the new, the new ones aren't fuel efficient enough to, to compensate for the growth. So um, those different bands on the, on the graph represent the different the pillars, the uh, new technology, which is the blue, um, operational improvements, and um, infrastructure improvements like next gen. Um, Market-based measures is a hot topic this month. There's a meeting starting the end of September that will, what it's called um, global market-based measures, where the airlines, through their governments, will try to agree on a way to um, offset our flights after 2020. I mentioned that that's our second goal. And they, the UN has an agency called ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, that um, is, is orchestrating this. So they're trying to, trying to get 190 or whatever airlines to agree on anything is really difficult, as you might guess. And then trying to get their governments to agree is even harder, because then they add on the political issues around, well, you know, why should we have to pay? We're a, we're a country that hasn't been flying very much, and suddenly we're being forced into the same scheme that US and the UK and other countries have been flying forever are in, so shouldn't we get some special considerations? So there's a lot of lobbying for, well, let's exclude fast-growing companies like uh, countries that are new to aviation like China. And we're going, China, really? Is that, you know, is that really like some country that needs special protection? Um, so there's a lot of arguing, but the thought is this, some, some form of this agreement, this voluntary agreement, will be in place um, by the end of the meeting, which ends in early October. And um, it'll be the first time any industry has come to a voluntary agreement to, on a way to reduce its emissions. So um, we're excited about that, although um, it's been a painful process getting there. We've gone to lots of meetings and read lots and lots of working papers on these topics. So how's Delta doing? Um, the graph 
on the top right there shows that the red airplanes, which are our larger narrow body planes, the ones with the single aisle, are generally the most fuel efficient. And that's partly because of the aerodynamics of a narrow body plane is better than a wide body plane. And also because um, they tend to fly routes like, say, Atlanta to Seattle that are pretty fuel efficient because they're kind of in the optimum range for that airplane. Plus, they don't have lie flat seats, which hurt things. Um, another thing is when you, when you fly a really long flight, like, say, Atlanta to South Africa or LA to Sydney, those flights aren't really efficient because you have to put so darn much fuel on the plane that for the first half of the flight, you're paying this fuel penalty just to fly all that heavy fuel around for the entire flight. So um, really big planes, in theory, can be pretty fuel efficient, but they're never going to be as fuel efficient as um, narrow body planes flying those 2,500, 3,000 mile hops. So Delta focuses on two things because they're, they're important to IATA and they're important to us. Fuel efficiency, and um, our fuel efficiency has gotten about 6% better since 2009, um, which, isn't up to, which isn't to the 1.5% goal that we're trying to reach. We haven't got enough new airplanes um, to, to get it. We're averaging a little over 1% over that time, which is pretty good. At least we're going in the right direction, but we're not there yet. With the 300 planes we're getting, we think we'll end up a lot closer to the 1.5% by the 2020 uh, end of that short-term short goal. And um, we measure it two ways. One is by what are called revenue ton miles, which nobody at our airline understands because it's this IATA metric where you, you, you say every passenger in their baggage weighs 220 pounds, and you take the actual weight of the cargo and you add it together. And airlines don't think like that. We think in terms of the second metric there, which is available seat miles. We know how many seats are on the plane. That generally doesn't change. That's much easier for us to wrap our head around. So we track both metrics. Um, part of the problem with the top one, for the operational people like me, is that we don't directly impact how full the planes are. So um, when you're tracking revenue ton miles, you may be doing a great job of flying your planes efficiently, you know, doing single engine taxis and low power takeoffs and all those things I showed on my slide, but you may still be um, not meeting this metric because the planes aren't full enough, so you don't have the high denominator on your, on your metric. When you have available seats, that doesn't change unless, unless we intentionally add them, so that's a, that's a good metric from the operational side because we always know what the denominator is. The um, other thing we're tracking is total greenhouse gas emissions, not just from aircraft, although as I mentioned, it's like 98.7% of the emissions, but also from our ground vehicles, what we call ground support equipment, uh, from our facilities, both our um, own facilities like our offices and our maintenance buildings, as well as the leased facilities like all the airport space, which we don't really, all we do is pay lease payment on that every month. We pay landing fees and other charges to airports, but we don't directly control that space. Um, so those emissions have declined 14% since 2005, which is the baseline the airlines have selected for. That was kind of the, the year when airlines in general were producing the most emissions. We had all these three and four engine airplanes out there, and, and uh, until, Reese, until close to 2005, jet fuel had been pretty cheap, so fuel efficiency wasn't a big consideration. Um, so you can see how dramatically our emissions on this, the bottom graph dropped from 2005 till about 2012 when we realized that a lot of the low-hanging fruit had been picked at that point. We've gotten rid of all the three and four engine airplanes. We'd implemented a lot of procedures like single engine taxi. Um, and the airline continued to grow and we could see that our emissions were getting worse. So what we'd started doing at that point is we started buying carbon offsets to make our to keep our emissions at 2012 levels. So right now, we're the only airline that are, that are doing carbon neutral growth, and uh, we're doing it for all of our emissions, not just our international emissions. So for example, in, for 2015, we're buying a little over two million metric tons of, of offsets um, to address our emissions, which, you know, which, which is great, and it's a good thing, but um, why aren't we investing in biofuels? Well, frankly, biofuels just aren't ready for us to invest in yet. Although we do have a refinery in, in Pennsylvania, so we have some unique capabilities in terms of helping figure out the logistics. And we're always talking 
to, to universities, to startups about biofuel opportunities, a couple right now that we're thinking about. Um, but it, it keeps coming back to those issues of what are we really accomplishing if we're not driving the price down? What are we accomplishing if we're not figuring out how to get a lot of this stuff to, to do, you know, if we buy 25,000 gallons of biofuel over the next three years, what does that really mean? We're gonna, over the next three years, we're gonna use 12 billion gallons of fuel. So 25,000 gallons of biofuel is like, is this, it's more like a publicity stunt, I think, to us than, than a real investment in the infrastructure of biofuels for airlines. I think we're looking for that opportunity where we can show, hey, we can take this up to 10 million gallons, 50 million gallons, 100 million gallons over the next few years. And how do you do that? What, what does this come from? What's the life cycle analysis on what you're making it from? Is it really that much better than conventional fuels when, when, all, when you're all in for it? So those are some um, tough decisions that we wrestle with almost daily. So um, my first case study is on the issue of buying an airplane, which you know, if you're, when you're thinking about it, it's not like um, going down and buying a car because you're going out and buying something that costs $100 million, $150 million. So it's a big decision. You want to make sure you get the right, the right plane. Um, the first bar on the left shows our actual operating costs uh, per available seat mile across the fleet. So it's 5.5 cents approximately to operate a plane. And about 80% of that cost is comprised of the, that blue bar, which is fuel, and the gray bar, which are maintenance. Those two we consider to be variable costs. They vary depending on how much you fly the plane. The more you fly it, the more you have to maintain it, the more fuel you have to put in it. Um, the red bar is the cost of ownership of the plane, um, what our fleet guys call rental. So um, that's just kind of the kind of in your mind, set the cost. So right now, fuel is where those, that second and third bar, it's, it's around $2 a gallon. So to operate an existing airplane, you can see costs us about um, three cents per available seat mile in fuel. And if we were to go out and buy a new plane, that's, let's assume it's, I don't know, 15% more efficient, um, it'll bring our fuel cost down from $3 to 261. But it's also gonna increase the um, ownership costs of that plane, because now you've got, you know, you've, you're getting rid of a plane that you've already paid for and buying this new $150 million plane. So in this example, when fuel's $2 a gallon, you can see the total cost of ownership actually goes up 10 cents an available seat mile because you bought that new plane. So kind of hard to justify buying new planes. But you know, the reality is airplanes are always in the market for new planes. If you come to us with a great deal, we're gonna seriously consider it because we know the fuel's not gonna be $2 a gallon forever and we need to keep replacing airplanes. Airplanes are you know, our lifeblood and they get old and you have to replace them. Eventually they get too expensive to maintain. Um, when you use the example on the far right here of um, fuel at $3 a gallon, you can see that the math changes quite a bit and um, the, uh, it, it actually, you're actually saving money by buying the new plane versus keeping your older plane. Okay. So if, you know, if we had a perfect crystal ball, we would know exactly the right time to be buying planes and what fuel was gonna be doing. We don't, that's why we own a refinery so we can have a physical hedge on pricing. Um, but w another factor here though is when um, fuel's cheap, airlines aren't as anxious to get new airplanes, so you might be able to get a better deal. So you might be able to bring the cost down a little bit when fuel is expensive and everybody wants new planes, then the costs go up. And so again, those, uh, the relative ratios of those bars might change as the red band gets a little bit bigger. So, um, so the fleet planning people, obviously this is dumbed down, but the fleet planning people, this is what they do. I don't know how they do it, but this is what they do every day is think about how much will we be paying for planes? When do we retire the MD-88s? You know, what, do we, what do we replace them with? Um, are we always gonna just dance with Boeing and Airbus? Are there others out there? Apparently there are, because we just, we just bought 50 or 75 Bombardier C-100s, which um, everybody seems excited about. Winglets, I mentioned them as an example of a technology improvement for existing planes. There's pictures of a few of them there. So winglets can be as inexpensive as a couple hundred thousand dollars, especially if you're 
if you're cannibalizing them off a plane that you're retiring and putting them on another plane, or, or if you're taking an existing winglet um, and, and changing it to a different kind, because a lot of the, the wing strengthening has already occurred. But they can also be as expensive about, as about a million dollars or more per airplane to install. So that gets into issues of how long are you going to have this plane? Is it going to pay back? Um, how much fuel efficiency you're getting? Typically, it's 3 to 5 percent fuel efficiency improvement. Um, they work better on planes that fly long distances than they do on planes that fly short hauls. So you might want to put them on your longer haul international planes first. And um, what is the typical payback? So the payback can be two or three years in the best case. It can be five or six years in the worst case. Um, so airlines typically buy all their new airplanes with winglets, but retrofitting them comes down to issues like how do you use that plane if it's a short haul plane? Um, when it's expensive to put them on, you're probably not going to do it. If it's a long haul plane that has another 15 years of life left, then you probably will do it. Um, so I've, I've included an example of some of the math that they consider um, down at the bottom of this graph. I'm not sure if you can read it or not. Center of gravity. This is a really interesting operational um, issue that was brought to us by a pilot at our um, one of our regional airlines. So airplanes, in order to fly fuel efficiently, need to have a center of gravity that's near the rear of the plane. Um, that's relatively easy to achieve on bigger planes, and it's hard to achieve on little regional jets with 50 seats, 70 seats, um, just because there's less room behind, behind the wings, and um, there's not as much cargo and stuff. So a lot of times we end up having to fly these planes with the, with the tail um, stabilizers, correcting for the inappropriate center of gravity, uh, which wastes fuel. And what you want to do then is get people to want to sit at the back of these planes. So how do you do that? You know, how, why would anybody want to sit at the back of the plane? You know, everybody wants to sit at the front of the plane, so when you get off, people think you sat in first class, even if you didn't. <laughs> it's, um, so it's this whole mind game. So what, what if we put the first class seats at the back of the plane? Would people sit there? How would, you, how would you incentivize people? Obviously, you can incentivize them by pricing those seats lower. But then how do you guarantee if the plane's not full that the people actually stay in those seats and don't move forward? So you know, that's a real challenge for us is how would you police this if you figured out, could you give them, uh, how about if you offset their flight? Would, would the people who are kind of green-minded say, yeah, it's great. If you're going to offset my flight, then I'll sit in the back. What if you gave them free drinks? Maybe, you know, so at least they'd have to be sitting there in order to get their free drink. So there's lots of, so from a marketing standpoint, think about how would you make people want to sit at the back of the plane knowing they're going to be the last one off the plane? You know, so they're, you're going to lose 10 minutes at the airport. You, know. so you would do that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we could board it from the back, but still people want to be, at, well, they're going to say, where are you going to, but they can't board these planes from the back because there's no door there. But um, they, they can board the larger ones from the back. But yeah, that is another possibility. If, the, if there is a way to board from the back, uh, maybe they could buy future regional jets with doors near the rear. Um, otherwise, sometimes they even have to put ballast in the, back, in, in the cargo bins to try to move the center of gravity on these small planes backwards. Plus, um, you know, it creates, people are going, well, if you're moving me around inside the plane, how safe is this plane, really? I mean, is it that important that I sit should I really have lied about how much I weigh when I got on the plane? I'm feeling a little guilty now. Um, I'm going to go tell the pilot that I, I really weigh you know, 160 instead of 140. Um, so anyway, this, this is a real interesting issue with us, and we continue to work with marketing on ideas to, um, to try to drive it. And it's only an issue when the plane isn't full. If it's, if it's already 95% fuel, it's not an issue. Okay, here's an example of um, actually a non-airplane example, if you can believe it. So this, in this case, um, we're going to go out and buy electric tugs. So Delta's got, I don't know, 12,000 of these bag tugs probably. And right now about 20% of them are electric. They cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $42,000. All the vehicles you see driving around moving baggage from the bag room to the plane or from the plane to the bag room. And um, it costs us another... I don't know, eight, ten thousand dollars for chargers, for high-speed chargers, 
for these things. And then they drive around, and on average, we think they use about nine gallons of fuel in a typical day. And obviously, there's a big, big if for the ones that are diesel, um, obviously, there's variation depending on the airport you're talking about and that particular tug, whether it stays around the concourse or whether it's driving between the concourse and the main terminal. Um, so if you do the math and you figure out the, the $42,000 cost and the cost of charging and um, compare that to the cost of fuel, you'll, you'll see that it takes somewhere around eight years for us to pay for this, which doesn't meet our two-year payback, but we buy these anyway for lots of reasons. Uh, one being local air quality laws, especially in places like California, where they're saying, well, we can't regulate your planes, but we can regulate your ground equipment. So we want you to get rid of those um, diesel tugs, gasoline tugs, replace them with electric. And we're going, yeah, but you guys don't have the electrical infrastructure here to allow us to install the chargers. And they go, yeah, that's true, but figure it out. And then they, they walk away. Um, so this is, it's, a, it's an interesting issue. You notice I didn't include the cost of electricity in this slide because it's baked into the lease. And um, frankly, there, it's not metered at the, at the individual charger level. So for, for right now, we're kind of getting the electricity for free, which is kind of an incentive to put in the chargers. But then all the airport people in the room are writing down, we can't let that happen. So um, eventually, I think they'll figure out a way to charge us for the electricity for these tugs. The tugs are good. We like them. My group likes them because they improve um, the air quality where people have to work, whether it's inside a bag room or if it's uh, right by the airplanes, they don't have to stand by um, a vehicle, especially like a, a loader for baggage. They don't have to stand by the exhaust for that. So that's a good thing. Um, if you talk to the drivers, though, they'll say, you know, I don't like those electric tugs so much. They're not as powerful. If you're, to if you're towing four or five bag carts, they're not as, as reliable. Uh, you can run out of charge halfway between term Concourse F in Atlanta and the main terminal and then you're kind of stuck. Uh, the reliability, therefore, is, is lower. You have to be charged. They're, we want to use them all the time, and so there's not really a good time except overnight to charge them. They may not go all day without a charging. So there's some logistical issues with the electrical equipment that the diesel ones uh, don't face. And my last case study is actually about a building, which you're probably glad I finally got to talk about a building here. And, um, so for us, doing building projects is hard. Um, we get pitches all the time for little solar arrays on our big maintenance building, this mile-long building down by the airport that says Fly Delta Jets. Um, the most recent one was for a solar thermal system, which actually could be pretty promising because it would uh, cut our natural gas use some, which might save us more money than electricity. So one of the issues is we're a big, big customer of Georgia Power, so we get really good electric rates. Hard to um, build a business case that you're going to pay back quickly because you're not going to pay back quickly. It's just There's just not um, the quick payback on these things. It's typically you know, eight years or so on a, on a typical solar project that we're pitched. We think it might be better on the solar thermal. We're still doing the numbers on that. We do lots of little projects, like this vending miser. This vending miser isn't actually one that's been approved yet, but it's intriguing. It's, it's inexpensive. It turns off the um, power at these soda machines when, um, when it doesn't, they don't need to be running. And it, supposedly, it saves about half the electricity used by these types of machines. And it, has, it has motion sensors, so it'll, if, it, if people come up, the lights come back on. And um, it also has thermostats, so it doesn't let the drinks get too warm, keeps, it keeps them at the right temperatures. Um, but we do projects all the time about lighting, you know, replacing lights with LEDs and motion sensors. And simple projects that pay back quickly are what are easy for us to justify. The problem is the electricity we get billed for is only about 0.3% of our, of our carbon footprint. And it's even less of that of our electrical footprint, I mean, of our electricity bill, of our energy bill. So um, really difficult to justify those types of projects. Plus, we like to spend our money where it's visible to customers. So you know, you'd, would you rather see a new airplane or a new sky club, or would you rather know that I have new carpeting in my office and new lighting that's more energy? You'd probably say, the heck with your office. I don't care where you work as long as I get a brand new airplane and as long as um, you know, I'm seeing electric tugs driving around outside. 
and, and, and we kind of get that. We, we try to spend money where it's visible uh, to people. So anyway, that's um, the end. Other than, I guess, the concluding remark would be that the airlines have a daunting challenge in reducing our climate impact, but I think we're all on the same page. We're all working to figure out how do we make biofuels work? How do we get as many new airplanes as possible? How do we retire old ones faster? Um, and, and so we are collaborative. We don't view that as a, we don't compete with each other on environmental issues, just like we don't compete on safety. We're all kind of, you know, we realize that our industry is viewed um, as an industry, not as individual players so much on things like safety and the environment.